you've seen Ted, right? Or you know Ted, the, the conference? Okay, I love it. Um, I was recently there, and there was one talk that, like, fully, I think when people speak their truth, uh, it's the most powerful thing that you could ever find. And especially as an entrepreneur, watching somebody speak their truth and tell their story and then have a, even a bigger mission from their pain and their truth was, like, unbelievably like if there's a TED talk you guys want to watch this year or that you should watch this year, that's the one. Um, she so was only there for one talk. No, only one. Yeah, right. I'm going to need to move this way. Um, sorry, I just would like this fireside chat style. Um, so Andy, I would love, like, I mean, we all know, you know, we know who you are, but I'd love for you to just give a little background of, you know, your, you, you know, how you started Bonobos, all the things that you've done, because you've really done such an incredible job in yeah. you know, D to C, but yeah. then in life. I'm Andy. Uh, I'm a, I'm a retired direct consumer founder. I'm recovering, uh, but I'm happy to be a part of the club. Um, grew up in Chicago, Cubs fan, mom's an Indian immigrant, dad's a Scandinavian white dude. Uh, my older sister, Monica, is still a direct consumer founder. Uh, she's got a brand called Monica and Andy which we now use um, extensively on our home. The focus has shifted from buying for myself to buying for our little guy, Isaiah, who's two and a half. My wife's an entrepreneur. We split our time between Chicago and Brazil when it's cold in Chicago. And I uh, got to write a book called Burn Rate, which was my focus the last couple of years, telling my journey, talking about my journey with bipolar one and sort of the hidden ways that entrepreneurship and mental illness intersect. And uh, Ted asked me to talk about that. And you were there. And I would love to just, I mean, so your whole journey just as an entrepreneur and your realization, because I think like the, the thing that's interesting is, you know, where you came from and how, you know, if you have like check, went to Wharton, check all of the things that like the, the check on the, on the achievers scale, when, you know, in your journey Wharton is more of a black mark than a check. <laughs> Black mark, but, um, but, but, you, but you know what I, but, but when, when, and I guess talk about the growth that you first, you know, saw with, with Bonobos and also even just like how you thought about Bonobos, how you decided that you were going to, you know, even join it, scale it. I mean, it's all in your book, but I would love to just, just for context of how it yeah. scaled so rapidly and how much, you know, the money that you raised, how you sold it, the whole thing. Yeah, no, I was listening to them. I mean, we, I don't, there's no press here, right? No. Right? Well, we're, we're videoed, but you can... Oh, we're, we're videoed? But who sees the video? Anyway, I, I don't think... I mean, I didn't know how to say this, but like, I don't think we started a good business model. I think we had an innovative idea around how to get to the customer. But from a business model standpoint, I actually think in the vast majority of categories, it doesn't really work. Like The math doesn't work. And if you just look at the public markets, we're seeing evidence of that now. So... I was hearing like the, the last group and I was like, oh, shoot, I want to talk about that, which is if we could go back, how we have done it differently. Because I think we, we tricked ourselves at the time into thinking that it was a venture capital backable business. And I'm not sure retail, retail has always meant to grow that way. You know, we were sort of at this stage where we're like, oh, let's build a tech company, but pretend it's a pants company. And then it's like, no, no, dumbass, like you sell pants and it's not really a tech company. And whatever, you know, 2007, 2008. But people didn't know at the time. I mean, really, know. at the end we of the day, like, I mean, you look at Zappos, that was a great example of, you know, tech tech investment money going into, yeah. you know, that business. Yeah. So we didn't, we didn't know any better, but we were trying to figure out as we went, how would you build something digitally from the ground up? And ironically, like looking back, it was some of the brick and mortar stuff that, that generated the most profit. And so I feel like if I could go back, we would do the Nordstrom deal that we did earlier, we would figure out our four wall retail model and maybe be more like thoughtful about the e-commerce growth and not try to grow so quickly, not try to raise so much capital. So unfortunately the story of what I did, you know, diverges from what I would advise now, at least, you know, sitting in the cheap seats up here. So now with Monica and Andy, which yeah. is an awesome, the children's brand, if you guys know, I mean, if you have kids, buy it. It's great. The f fabric, everything. That was like the, the, the first thing that I bought for my, for my daughter. Um, what, what, are, what learnings have you taken from Bonobos and what kind of learnings would you, would you impart on some of these brand founders? I mean, it has been a brutal three years. Like my sister is an unreal CEO. I've seen her week in, week out, like cash flow stress. I'm literally, 
should have died 10 times in the last three years. The company, uh, not the humans. And <laughs> but sometimes it feels just, like the humans. <laughs> it does, well, it can feel that way. And um, we've had to just totally transform the business. I think, you know, I can just kind of, I don't know how like in the weeds we want to get here, but change out the fulfillment center, re-architect the gross margins with the head of supply chain from Carter's, think about a different distribution mix where we lean down on marketing spend and open up a wholesale partnership, take the team down from 34 people to 20 people at the same time as we're doubling the business. Like all these different things that have been so difficult, set aside, we all live through COVID and all this stuff. It's just been really hard. And like, finally, we made half a million of profit in January of this year. And I was like, holy shit, profit. I've never heard of profit. Like, I've never seen anything like this. Like, this is incredible. And the way that it happened was because of the wholesale partnerships that have enabled us to, like, get the business to scale. And this is my point about D2C is we put so much energy into this channel, into this approach, and the business model is hard. And so how do we unlock the power of the brands that we're building that really outperform their size? And Walmart, funnily enough, twice, um, at least in my life, has been amazing. First with Bonobos was acquired by Walmart in 2017. And then about a year ago, we launched Monica and Andy at Walmart. And they're like, okay, 2,000 stores. And you're just like, oh, my God. Like the rate at which you can scale when you have that partnership kind of invites this question of like, what is the right way to build a brand in this day and age? Do you have any advice on working with companies like or retail partners like a Walmart, a Target, a, you know, for for you know as you're trying to scale? What do you guys want to know? I mean, I think one thing that I did incorrectly was I misapprehended how good at retail traditional retailers are. Right? So like indirect to consumer, it's like, oh, we know what we're doing. This is the new way of doing things. And it turns out that people that run really big businesses that have been around for 30, 50, 70 years are good at retail too. And it's a different mindset, but it tends to be know your customer, pay your suppliers on time. And having now been in business with Nordstrom in a big way at Bonobos, Walmart at Monica and Andy, it's like these people know what they're doing. And so try to stay in stock, make sure you don't screw up on your side and kind of don't worry as much about the negotiation of the margins and things like that. At first, it looks bad when you compare it to your core business. But then if you compare it to your core business, fully burdened for marketing spend and for team, it actually might be better. And so it's more like, how do, I, how do we help them win? That's my mentality. It's not like, how do we get a better end of this deal? How do I get you to win? Right. And if you're winning, it's like, wait, are you sure that's enough margin for you? Right? It's more that mentality yeah. because if they're making money, then you make money. And so it's kind of trying to figure out how to be in service to them and their customer as a mindset rather than treat it as this like thing over here where you don't control it. Right. So that's okay. You don't have to control everything in this life. You know, like what, whatever you own owns you back. Um, speaking of letting go of, of control or, or just what I love about you, and I'm just going to tell you is you have so much self-awareness and humility. But I don't know, did that, what, were, you, were you that way when you started Bonobos or is it just from like all of your experiences and kind of, I mean, I think you should, we should, I'd love for you to just kind of walk through, you know, the, the moments that like kind of brought you to the place where now your mission is really about, you know, the, the three, you have, you have, um, you know, a, a crusade on mental health, health in the workplace and yeah. how, and, and how that is like really like, if I was to say, okay, who you were stepping into like your ultimate mission and your ultimate power, that was what I saw on the Ted stage yeah. was that. Um, but I just would love to understand, you know, how that, how that happened. Cause it was big. Yeah. I mean, maybe I can share a story. I would say probably, um, I don't, I think life teaches you the humility sometimes. I mean, maybe God bless you if you've got it on the way up, but it was, um, I felt in retrospect, I see so much more insecurity at the time, both before really having a, my wife now, like uh, my insecurity came from being lonely and not knowing if I would ever find a partner. And so I was sort of, I don't know, have you, have you ever met like a bachelor guy who maybe isn't so self-confident? Has that ever happened? <laughs> but like projecting a lot, but maybe that's overcompensating for something. I don't know if anyone you know anyone like this. So that was like me. 30% of 
<laughs> yeah, seventy percent. Uh, that was me plus like the the business always needing to project that it, we were winning, but like privately knowing we were losing in terms of the financials of it, right? So we raised a hundred million, which means we lost a hundred million. And so when you're when you're on that the other side of that, it's always like, oh, we're winning, but we're not. Is sort of the duality that I lived with. And then with bipolar uh, one, which I was diagnosed with when I was 20, but not really treating, addressing, medicating until 2016, it was sort of a, a messy, it was a messy era. And it was really only when I had a second psychotic episode, the first one I was 20, the second one I was 36, we were nine years into building bonobos, we'd raise over 100 million, had over 500 employees. And I spent a week at Bellevue Hospital here in New York in the psychiatric ward. I was brought to the psychiatric ER. It was another um, incident of psychosis, delusion, past people on the street, you know, who are in the midst of a psychotic episode. That was me. And I was finally ready to deal with it. I was like, okay, I'm 36 this time. I'm not in denial. Like, this is clearly what I've been dealing with. All these highs and lows of the entrepreneurial journey were almost like a cover for the underlying mood disorder. And I think it's, I think it's both. Like I think, yes, startups or businesses are a roller coaster, but I kind of had two roller coasters going at the same time. And I walked out of Bellevue, you know, finally ready to deal with it. And I walked straight into handcuffs and I was arrested and charged with misdemeanor and felony assault. And if you'd like to know the rest, you can read the book, <laughs> but that it was such a, it was such a reckoning on another scale that I think that a lot of the um, self-awareness and humility was forced upon me. I can't, I can't take credit for it. I'll give it to my mom and to, you know, all the, all the suffering that kind of but got to galvanize. But the, the amazing thing about you is you faced it, you owned it, you actually are using this as a mission because, you know, in the workplace, and we see this with, within startups, and honestly, like, we all lived through COVID, it was super isolating, it was, this is like, I just think work is, you know, and especially if you love work, there's the ups, the downs, you're dealing yeah. with personal stuff that you wouldn't normally, you know, like, there's different parts of your life, and we're all apparently going to live till we're 120 now, and so, and we, we all have to probably work much later in life as well, so mm -hmm. how, how do you think that because you've now done a ton of research into the mental health and you're working yeah. with a lot of different things but what do you think the change needs to where where's the change need to happen I mean, there's so much a... shame and the mental health is that there's a stigma like if yeah. people take time off for oh they can take time off if they broke their leg they take time off or whatever but if but sometimes the mental health is probably the hardest thing I mean I'm not saying physical Ill, but it is something that people grapple with and people, but nobody, but everyone wants to sit there and they want to smile and pretend like everything's okay. When like, you yeah. know, sometimes, the, sometimes the sky's, you know, the yeah. sky's falling. Yeah. I think accepting that mental health conditions tend to actually increase the probability of business success is a good frame, right? So for bipolar disorder, one to 3% of the general population, 11% for entrepreneurs. ADHD, depression, substance use, all of these things for better or for worse over index in people who are building and creating things. And so the goal would be that when you meet someone who shares with you their, their condition, you say, oh, that's like, you know, this is probably going to be a successful person <laughs> more so than general pop, you know, in the general population. And I, I don't mean that like cynically, but these things go hand in hand. And I remember um, uh, for the TED Talk, I was researching. I wanted to talk about something super innovative that we take for granted now. And I came up with air travel. And it's just a part of the talk. So I was like, oh, what about the Wright brothers? And then my wife is Brazilian. And if you're from Brazil, you know that the Wright brothers didn't invent air travel. It was this guy named Alberto Santos Dumont. And like, it's like a joke that the Wright brothers take credit. So I was like, oh, let me just dig into this. And of course, Alberto Santos Dumont had bipolar, died by suicide. The Wright brothers were known to have, like, be on the autism spectrum, high-functioning Asperger's. And I was like, of course. Like, of course. And so we need to get to a place where you can disclose what you're dealing with without it being a career-limiting move. If anything, we should observe that people who, can, who deal with their shit, who have these different stripes of neurodiversity, might not be a bad thing. Maybe even 
I, I don't want to say superpower, but somewhere, somewhere in there, right? And then I think the other thing is to, and we're in New York, so this already happens, but to include all of us in the concept of having mental health challenges, right? You may not deal with something chronic like I do. You may not have to take medication every day, see a psychiatrist twice a week. But I'm pretty sure if you've been walking this earth for, I don't know, 25, 30, 35 years or more, there hasn't been a moment where, you know, at some point you've been thrown on your ass by life. Life just has a way of doing that. It can be grief. It can be a breakup. It can be financial stress. We're all going to face some acute crisis of mental health at some point. And so if we can include all of us in that, Rather than like, oh, there's the guy, you know, with the bipolar. And I, I mentioned this in the talk of like, there's the guy that is bipolar. It's like, well, no, no one is cancer, <laughs> right? They have it. So I'm probably not equated to, from an identity standpoint, this condition. And so if we can, if we can kind of widen our aperture, then it's like, all right, cool. This is just something we all need to deal with. And, and then I think it comes down to reimbursement. Because the, the number one way we reveal our values is our money. Yeah. And the reimbursement is just too low for, for mental health stuff. And so I'm hoping that there's going to be a mental health insurance product that is developed. Um, in the meanwhile, there's a lot of work for, for governments to do. And what's cool about mental health is it's a bipartisan consensus issue now, which is, which is cool. Like two states have a bill right now for a billion dollars for mental health care. New York, New York and North Carolina. And so if you've got states that different that agree on something, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's in the water. So I think this is happening, which is cool. It's, I mean, it's brilliant that you're able to tell, and especially at your, at your level, to be able to be as honest as you are on this. Um, and then in terms of just, you know, I, I'm sure people have come to you with like their stories in the workplace. Are where... Are there companies that you're seeing are really doing a great job at embracing this? And and as a leader, what what suggestions do you have just on you know yeah. an individual level or even as an, as a manager? Yeah. Well, I think yes, there are companies doing good things. One of the ones um, we just copied. So we now offer. I've got a new company. Maybe we can do this because it's only 11 people. But we offer now $200 um, a month per employee for an additional mental health stipend that goes to reimbursable expenses above and beyond insurance, right? And so the idea is let's not do this stuff as a cost center. Let's do it as a profit center, which means a more productive employee base is going to be higher performing. And so let's invest as a higher performing team. And I think we can't frame things as a cost center because then no business owners are going to spend money on it. Um, and I believe it. Like I, th I think a healthier a more mentally fit team is going to do better. So I think that's one thing that we can all do is, is think about how to support our teams and ourselves in that regard. And I'll often meet like pre-seed, seed staged tech founders and I'll say just expense it as a cost of doing business. It's two to three percent probably on top of your salary. And there's not a there's no one that can be like that's a bad business expense in this day and age. That's the cool thing about this day and age is you can just be like, fuck it, I'm doing it. <laughs> right? And so that's kind of one cool thing is seeing above and beyond investment. The other thing, and this is for everyone here, you can just share at some point selectively what you're dealing with, with the people around you. And it's really empowering. It doesn't have to be a lot of time. You don't have to like have your team be doing therapy for you. But if at some point you just spend a couple of moments sharing something that's been difficult for you or is difficult for you, totally changes the culture of your team because it creates a safe space for other people to then bring their full selves to work. Uh, and I think it inspires more followership than leading, you know, by projected strength. So when you shared like what was happening for you, yeah. how was it received? And then also on the investor level, because we all know the Silicon Valley investors and, and, uh, you know, and you were made, I mean, again, I know the heyday of Bonobos, like you were made to, you were the poster child for this is the innovation, like retail innovation. Yeah. You were, you know, you just as the person was kind of held up to that, yeah. that, you know, standard of just like, you know, yeah. the mascot. So, yeah. I mean, look, I know many of you may have things that are like hidden from sight that if you disclosed would be really news to other people. And that's, those are hard things to share. 
Um, for me, what was, what was kind of funny about it in a dark way is when I did disclose, Hey, you know, I have bipolar one, there was a lot of like, Oh <laughs> yeah. Oh, tell me about that. Right. And there's this like, I mean, this is the wrong joke, but fuck it. There's this joke about narcissistic personality disorder, which is that it's the only illness where everyone is treated, but the patient <laughs> is dark joke. Right. But it's the kind of thing where it may be that this hidden part of your mental health stuff is not so hidden, right? And so describing it is actually like, oh, they know, right? Or like, oh, they, they, there's, a word, there's an explanation for this, right? And so it, it, it's like we hold this idea that these disclosures carry so much power for other people, but they don't. Other people don't care in the sweetest possible way about any of us. <laughs> they don't. They're just no one else is as focused on, on ourselves as we are. And so it sort of becomes a question, like a thought experiment. If someone's going to think about you for like 10 minutes, would you rather have them think about you in a way that is like what you would want them to see or what is actually there to be seen? And it turns out that what is going to make a far more lasting and enduring impression upon people is like who you are when you take that mask off. And it's just nice. Like I just carried around this thing that I thought would be such a big deal to other people for so long. In writing this book and telling the story, it's like no one gave a fuck about me. No one's like, oh, I wonder what Andy, you know, I wonder what Andy Dunn's mental health situation is. <laughs> no one cared. But to me, it was such a big deal, right? It felt like this ocean of pain. And I don't want to underestimate how hard it is to get there. For me, it took, I don't know, six or seven hundred therapy sessions to be able to metabolize having been violent or metabolize having had delusions of grandeur. This stuff's hard. I'm not saying it's easy to speak the words, but just know that no one cares <laughs> in the best possible way. But I, I think that, you know, what's inspiring is the way that you're dealing with it, right? Like you have, you've have frameworks, you have all of these things you, you see, you know, psych a psychiatrist twice a week, like there's, you're facing it in such a huge way versus most people. And I, you know, again, like know a lot of startup founders and they're like, no, I'm the, I'm the genius. And I, you know, that's, it's, uh, it's hard to have that, that sense of humility to actually take a look and, and, you know, put it out there. Um, and, but I do think that that's, that's, what's the most powerful thing is as you know, if you can show your imperfections, cause we're all human, we're all humans building businesses. Like all we want to do is do well in our roles. Right. And, and have some mission bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, you have a huge mission. I would, I mean, so 10 years from now, what do you, what do you hope like the mental health system is, looks like? Um, yeah. and then, you know, if you want to talk about, I think we're not talking about your next startup, your, your next company, but you are working on another company. But we won't yeah. talk about that just yet. I mean, um, let's talk about that for a second. Okay. Just because I think that we have a social isolation crisis now, right? The, and, and maybe it's a little bit less so in this kind of a crowd, but, but maybe not. Um, it's something to kind of investigate. Like, do I feel lonely? Because it's sort of like a funny thing to belong to, right? It's, a, it's sort of like its own form of like quiet stigma, the idea of like being lonely. And so there's all this mental health tech innovation happening. Um, and I'm, I think it's cool. I'm cheering a bunch of companies on. I've gotten to be an angel investor in those companies. I feel like I have no like edge in understanding it other than to back people from an angel standpoint. So I spent some time looking at like, what are the roots of what are the roots of the challenge? And there's a book from the year 2000 called Bowling Alone. I don't know if you remember this, but basically it like talks about how once upon a time we had family, we had friends, we had an in-person workplace then, we had a, a town square, we had religious organizations, we had like the Loyal Order of the Elks or whatever that is. I don't know what that is. But we had all these different, okay, we'll talk about that. We had all these different kind of like intersecting tribes and really, only for the last 100 years did we move away from, the, from our extended tribal families. Like, I live now in the, a mile away from my mom, my sister. They live in the same building. I don't know how they, they do it. Like, I don't know how anyone raises a child without seven or eight adults who are unpaid. <laughs> in, I don't know how people even do it. Like, my wife and I are confused. 
And that's how we lived as a species for, you know, 70,000 years, just until the last 100 years. And then now, you know, well, at some point, the research was that the third place was, became Starbucks, the third most visited place. It was home, work, Starbucks, which is why Starbucks has like 150 billion in market cap. And now we don't even have work. I mean, a lot of people have work. But a lot of people here, like you don't have an in-person physical workplace that you need to go to or have to go to or want to go to. So it's like it's all a screen. And so we started this company. It's called Pi. And the question was basically how do we get – how do we use technology to bring people back together in small groups? So it's, it's basically like paperless post or evite for five to 15-person hangouts but text message driven because the best laid plans fall apart not because people don't want to do them but because of – can't establish like the date where everyone's available. So the first thing in the product is like a simple poll to figure out when people are free. And then it kind of like builds from there. And I don't want to like nerd out on books too much, but the most neglected relationship in our lives are platonic friendships. So if you look at the research on relationships, relationships with our children, we derive the most meaning. Relationship with our partner or spouse is like the most joy and pain, but it's almost equally balanced. Relationship with our families are like good, but fraught with obligation. Platonic friends is like the ideal because it's the maximum joy and the minimum effort and it's maximum vulnerability, which is why I feel like picture the last time you were at dinner with like a bunch of your friends or one good friend. It's like a joyous thing that happened, but we do less and less of that over time. We tend to. And so how do we restore platonic friendships is the question. And the, the research on platonic friendships are that they form in two ways, mutual vulnerability and ongoing unplanned interactions in small groups in the real world. And so once we're out of school and we're out of an in-person workplace, like how do we make friends? Like how do you make friends? And if you're, if you're in a situation where you're thinking about that, there's not a lot of amazing answers to it. And so that's what we're kind of chipping away at. I love that. And tactile, I mean, tackling that in terms of just the happiness level of humans. Um, yeah, I, I mean, your mission. Wow. Wow. It's really incredible. Um, I, I can bring anybody questions from the audience. Okay. Back there here, Michelle, I'm going to yeah. run. Okay. I love to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. I love to hear your thoughts on the extent to which sort of the acceptability of mental health services within the workplace can stop the self-medication, which often has bad byproducts. Yeah. Because there's a lot of behaviors, some of which are actually condoned within offices, like yeah. of alcohol use or whatever, which are often self-medicating situations and the extent to which the, the balance needs to shift there. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, I, I, was, a, I was an alcoholic for sure as a, as a form of medicating bipolar. You know, when went up in a state called hypomanic, which is really a shy of delusional, but high energy, high creativity, you know, the flight of ideas, racing speech, so much energy, burning the candle at both ends. It's a pretty typical mood state, actually, for people who are building something. One of the best ways to come down from that is alcohol. So for me, like the equation was, you know, a hypomanic day, as much caffeine as possible. And then like just craving that six o'clock drink. And if this is how you're feeling right now, enjoy the evening. <laughs> but it, you know, it was 15 or 20 drinks a week for like 15 years. And that's not good. And I just think about like the brain cells. I listen to the Huberman Lab podcast now, which I probably shouldn't. And it's like, I can't do enough cold plunges <laughs> to make up for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. So Yes. Yes, and I think it's another example of where, like, this actually isn't a cost center. It's not like, this isn't charity that we should all be doing, taking care of our mental health and investing in it. It's actually, like, a good investment, personally and professionally, I think. Well, you have time for one more question. You said something about launching into 2,000 Walmart stores versus 11,000. How do, how, do you think that's a good move to do incrementally? Yeah. Like Everything in life is good to do incrementally. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what a, it's weird. It's, we have this business value of, like, growth. Yeah, go big or go home. And it's like, yeah. but why? Why do we have to grow so much? Yeah. If, you know? And I know why, with, but it's just it's a stupid way of living, I think. Like, some growth. 
but we just need to chill the fuck out, like collectively. It's not working that well for us, all this growth stuff. So if you can compound growth at 10% or 20% for 30 years and own you know, a big chunk of what you do, that's actually how the wealthiest families in the world operate. They don't do this weird shit. Like they own shit and they grow it methodically and for the long term in an enduring way. And I think that's so aspirational and under-celebrated. Amazing. Andy, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, everybody. Thank you.